Welcome back to the Next Level Sega fans on the podcast where the 90s still feel like yesterday. I'm Dan the Mega Driver, one half of the Sega guys, and with me, he's the Darth Vader to my Kraken. It's James the Sega Holic. How are you doing, mate? <laughs> I'm very good, Mitre. <laughs> uh, join us on the yeah. dark side. <laughs> had a few coughing problems so uh maybe that was a little wet <laughs> i i think i could use i could use vader's um mouth apparatus at the at present mate because uh <laughs> a bit a bit chesty um recovering from a cold but this the well has run dry it has so this is going out pretty much hot off the press this one this will be going out you know days after being recorded so. i know <laughs> we've got four days four four five days to edit this We'll get it done, mate. We always get it done. Well, mate, we've been we've been, you know, pretty prolific recently. You know, again, we talk about a year ago, year eighteen year to eighteen months. We we didn't have time to make an audio podcast, and then uh, (laughs) now now it's definitely two videos a week. Uh, This this week we had three. (laughs) Yeah, you were obviously away in the lovely city of Venice for your for your wife's birthday. Yeah, Um, so we can put this all down to you. Yeah, pretty much. I was sitting there. Obviously, we had the the review, which is a new series that we've just launched. Um, to kind of go into that a wee bit, we decided to do kind of bad influence styled reviews where there's there's no retrospective kind of stuff in there, no deep dives, just no frills to the point reviews. So you give your views, I give mine. At the end, we give a score out of five stars very similar to the kind of bad influence we don't have dinosaurs to put either side of the gameplay like bad influence <laughs> did but you know dinosaurs and jeans and a a funny color jacket but um yeah we've put the first one out which was obviously die hard arcade on the saturn that went out on saturday um and then we had the news that tomb raider unfinished business got a port for the sega saturn um retro raider john has you know put a team together and they've basically ported the PC expansion from 1998 to the Saturn and I thought you know I, I can't let that pass without putting something on the channel so 20 minutes recorded six minutes of gameplay a couple of minutes of me speaking about it and, and put it up and that's that's went great guns um, and then on Monday our scheduled content was <laughs> The, the Altered Beasts retrospective that you've done. Yeah. Um, and at present, that's careering towards the, the thousand views as well. So um, you add on, you know, you've got the, the review, the Tomb Raider, Altered Beast. You know, you've got all those, those kind of three coming out within a short period of time. Um, and they've went down great. So hope everybody's enjoying it. Um, it's not, not planned that we fire out three videos in four days. So don't get used to... <laughs> that that level we have jobs and families but um when when we can put something out you know we, we will we will do so but i think the, the the big news was that tomb raider port mate which i think is is remarkable and just another example of just the, the community around the sat and the things that are continuing to be done with a system it's well, just un, unreal the thing the, the, the way you know we could put a team together I mean, this speaks volumes about the scale of these projects and the passion of the people involved. This isn't just, um, and I know a lot of the time, you know, all these modders, they're very passionate people and there'll be more than one or two of them. But, you know, putting putting a team together really talks about the scale that these people are applying to these things. And it's it's fantastic that so many people have got this level of passion for old Sega systems, especially the Sega Saturn, which, you know, obviously the history it has, the commercial performance, the way it's often you know blamed for you know being the end of sega or starting the end of sega um the fact that so many people are turning into to, beginning to love it now and understand what an amazing <laughs> system it was is fantastic and uh it's 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 the sort of the message that we've been trying to bang on for a long time and that you know it's, it's such a special system and you know as we say all sega systems are and that's kind of what we try to do is is you know for those of you that grew up with sega we try and help you you know really of the good times for those of you that um in you know sega haven't made a console for over 20 years now and you know introduce you to why we love sega I mean, looking at our demographic i think it's a lot more of the la- of the former than the latter yes <laughs> but um 
but yeah, still, I mean, there's a lot of Mega Drive fans that may tune in, or Dreamcast fans that didn't give the Saturn a chance, and now appreciating it. So um, it's good to see that that, that level of commitment from from teams like uh, that, that have done Tomb Raider Unfinished Business. They did do the Tomb Raider 2 demo as well, didn't they? Um, yep. Was that maybe a year ago or a few months back? I, if I remember, they, they essentially rebuilt levels or parts of levels from Tomb Raider 2 in the Tomb Raider 1 engine. Yeah. So um, it was kind of meant to give a, a, a glimpse as to what it could look like. Now, it's going to be a hell of a big job, but I, I think given how good Unfinished Business runs in, you know, the, the, yeah, there's some kind of maybe graphical oddities that the, the water in that first stage, because it's, it's a vast area of water, it does look a wee bit kind of, from a distance, it can look quite kind of off-putting and kind of quite, mess like the, the, the kind of scenery merges with it a wee bit and the, the ripple effects on the top but that's just the way Saturn was was generating the, the water in Tomb Raider yeah. so um, that's not a, a, a slant on the port that's just the way the system generated those particular visuals but I think there's a very good chance that we will see these guys put Tomb Raider 2 out there it, it might not be you know next month six months a year but I think they will get there and that in itself will be kind of like a vindication for us because, you know, we all know the the, the worst kept secret when we Sony paying off essentially core to, yeah. to keep, you know, Tomb Raider 2 off of, of Saturn. So if we can get that, you know, in some shape or form and if it, you know, if I was talking to Saturn Dave about this and by the way, if you want to see kind of in-depth chat, you know, with uh, Retro Raider John, the Shiro guys have got a, a article up on their site and there's kind of quotes about the development and stuff like that, you know, with uh, Retro Raider John. So check that out. I've put the link down there. Um, and you can check that out as well. But I, I think there's every chance that we will see it. You know, yeah. it, as I say, I was talking to Dave and I said, the way that it runs, you know, it even, it feels exactly like Saturn Tomb Raider. You know, yeah. Saturn Tomb Raider's controls, you always felt as if you were almost fighting with them. Sometimes they were, they weren't like massively responsive. There was a wee bit of it almost felt like a lag. Yeah. But it, but it wasn't. It was just like it just they've just nailed it. The, the weight of the controls, everything, it just it's, it's absolutely superb. Um the initial build that John put out on his mega page, when I tried to load it, it didn't actually work on Fenrir. Now I've been told that the guys have got Fenrirs that were doing this, so that was a bit kind of strange. Um I removed the underscores from the file names and it got past the loading, the Fenrir loading screen, but then it stuck at the, the license to Sega screen. So message Dave. Dave gets in touch with a couple of the guys on the, the Shiro Discord. Within 10 minutes, Derek Pascarella, the awesome A-team, has come back with a rebuilt version for Fenrir because it turns out that Fenrir doesn't like certain bin Q file configurations. I think if too much is contained within it, it was all very technical, but I think if too much of the game is contained within the bin file, like Fenrir can't read it. Now, it was just a single bin in a single Q file, but bulk slash English translation is a single bin and single Q file, and that works fine. But Derek's went away and, and used the, the Sega starting patcher and, and basically built a a Fenrir compatible version, so that is now on John's mega page as well. So, oh, if you've got an ODE, guys, go and check it out. It's it's brilliant to see such a mainstream franchise that made its debut to the world on the Saturn coming back. <laughs> She's back, belongs. back where it belongs, and uh, yeah, it'd be fantastic. Obviously, Tomb Raider Two would be fantastic to have. Uh, this has been a fantastic port. I, I never was planned to be ported, but now I found port and mate, lost ports, of course, is the order of the day on this on this episode. Um talking about lost ports that were found though, obviously we had Lost in the Arcade Volume One, uh, which we recently re-uploaded to YouTube. It was originally an audio only podcast. Um, so we took the audio from that, added the gameplay footage and um I think the reception to that was pretty warm uh, and set us up for the long promised, the long overdue volume two. 
Um, but a lot has changed <laughs> in the intervening years because two of the games that were on our respective lists uh, will soon no longer be lost to the arcade or will actually make their way onto modern consoles by way of the uh, Like a Dragon or Yakuza series. Yes, mate, because and it's two pretty big hitters as well. So it's obviously Daytona USA 2 and Spike Out. <laughs> yes. So we've, we've lost two big hitters. Um, like the big one is, is Daytona USA 2, you know, coming over in the form of, you know, Sega Racing Classic 2. <laughs> um, no Daytona license anymore, but I think we'll take that. I think a lot of people have said on, on Twitter that they don't care what means Sega have to bring these games to modern consoles if they've lost a license just take out the brand and yeah. give it a generic name we don't care the, the the name on the name in the box doesn't matter it's it's, it's what's it's what's in the game so I I mean I, I kind of joked you know it's like Daytona USA 2 is coming to Xbox Game Pass it's like <laughs> yeah. you get this bonus game called Yakuza with it <laughs> well, you'll probably have to, knowing Yakuza, you've probably got a good couple of hours of uh, cutscenes and adventuring to do beforehand. But uh, I, I love, obviously, I love the uh, the Yakuza games. I'm I'm trying to finish off Like a Dragon, like Yakuza 7, which is known as Yakuza Like a Dragon in the West. Um, and uh, I was playing it last night, and the cutscenes are, you know, just walk that tightrope between serious crime drama and absolutely ludicrous the, the story in it is great and gripping and wacky but then i was trying to grind some levels and uh the one special move i was doing this like battle arena thing and this one move that uh we did like you combine attacks with characters look like, like chrono trigger and games like that back in the day and um the guy had drunk a bit of booze spat out some uh <laughs> spat out fire and i hit the uh and the main character hits uh, Ichiban hits uh, the enemy with an uppercut with a uh, with a sledgehammer. But the the enemy at the time was this chicken man. It's called Mister McNugget or something. And I was just thinking, this game is just <laughs> absolutely bizarre. Is that, I've got is that not a question in one of the Sega Lounge challenges or something. Yeah, well, the Nugget was the Nugget is the chicken. It's an actual chicken, <laughs> like a normal sized chicken. <laughs> that uh, managed your property portfolio in Yakuza 0, whereas in this one, it's an enemy called M Mr. McNugget or something that's got a long... That's a, basically a human with a long chicken or rooster neck. <laughs> and Is that head. not the guy for Owl's toy bum? <laughs> it looks a lot like him, yeah. <laughs> oh, but yeah, great series and well worth playing yeah. Sega Racing, Racing Classic 2 in. Obviously, two games that we were going to include, so Daytona USA 2, Long Overdue, it should have had a Dreamcast port. Obviously, we got mm. we got the original Daytona USA remade yet again <laughs> for the uh, for the arcade, which I recently picked up. <laughs> I've seen been... that the yeah. Japanese version. Yeah, uh, just keep in mind you can't tweak the handling on that. I know. <laughs> Godspeed, mate. <laughs> I've got to try and adapt, adapt and overcome. But uh, yeah, why they didn't just either put the Daytona two tracks in there. Or, or just, you know, it would have made sense to trip to port Daytona USA 2. Or if they couldn't do that, port the tracks over and add them to the tracks that were in 2001. So baffling that 2000, that Daytona USA 2 never came to Dreamcast in either of its forms. Mm -hmm. And all we had until uh, Like a Dragon Gaiden releases next month is Outrun 2 and its bonus tracks. Yep. I, I mean, it's weird, isn't it? You would think that why would you go back to CCE for the Dreamcast game? Like, even if you want to go back to CCE and bring in, you know, the Daytona tracks, the Daytona 2 tracks on top of that, then fine, just have one big package. Yeah. But to completely omit the Daytona 2 tracks was, was bizarre. Um, yeah. And Daytona USA 2001, for all intents and purposes, it's, it, it could pass for a Model 3 game. It's, it's, it's a pretty game. It's gorgeous. I mean, in some ways, in some ways, it does trump even the um, 360 and PS3 versions with the level of detail and mm -hmm. the level of popping, um, because obviously they're extremely faithful to the Model 2 original, which looks stunning. 2001 looks amazing. 
better in some respects in some respects and again it comes down to that which we've touched on before kind of the design ethos behind it the way that the hornet looks the way it looks so like squashed down it looks like um <laughs> it looks like a car out of mask <laughs> sorry mass crusade <laughs> working overtime fighting crime you can just imagine one of the characters from that jumping in there and the wheels coming out it's uh it's a I... weird design it's because the wheels pop out the side. Now, if you change how hard the tyres are, I think if you make the tyres harder, it brings them in. Oh, does it? But you can get to the opposite if you pick the hardest tyre set, and they're sunk in. <laughs> so you look like Batman's Batmobile whenever he, in Bat is it Batman Returns, whenever he fires off the side bits and just goes right through the gap. And <laughs> <laughs> Was that the first Batman? Is that Batman Returns? I watched them recently. Kind of mind, but you know about I'm talking about never they, yeah. they basically split. that's what it looks like, just the wheels come straight in. Yeah. So but if you go the other way and you make like the super soft tires, it's sticking away out to here. <laughs> oh but yeah, uh Daytona USA too, long overdue and spike out as well coming to Yakuza Yakuza eight or Like a Dragon, Infinite Wealth, as it's uh, officially known. Um, this one didn't get as much fanfare. So Sega Racing Classic got its own tweet. Yeah. To say it's coming to Like a Dragon, Gaiden, uh, the man who erased his name. Whereas Spike Out was in kind of a montage alongside Sega Bass Fishing and a bunch of other stuff. And all of a sudden it's, oh, it's Spike Out. You know, <laughs> the, the once upon a time in Hollywood, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio gave up. <laughs> <laughs> um I know uh, John Linneman tweeted saying, uh, "saying I'm, pr I'm pretty sure Richard Ledbetter will be will be pleased because uh, remember he was a massive fan of it back in the Sega Saturn magazine days, and it's good to know that he's still got a lot of enthusiasm for it." That's that. See, if you've got a favourite Sega game, mate, that that love never never fades. <laughs> Just if you've always got the hope <laughs> that you're going to get a home port, so Rich will be lining up to play it, and. It was kind of similar as well the way that Virtua Fighter 3 TB was announced. It was just kind of, well, there's been montage of games. And you go, hold on a minute. Is that Taka Arashi? It's like. It was just in, it was just cut out in the corner somewhere. It was just like, oh. <laughs> that was, that was kind of like the, the fighters in Street Fighter 6. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the daft faces whenever you're waiting for the fight to start. Yeah, I know. But yeah, Spike Out, Spike Out, great, great fighting game. A little bit cheap, or a bit scrolling beat em up rather, a little bit cheap. I played through it recently, uh, and it is tough. Uh, definitely a coin a coin guzzler, but a brilliant game. I've got Battle Street on the Xbox, and yeah. it's not quite as good as the arcade original. Um, no. Carries a lot of the old, same iconography, same, here comes the boss, break the gates. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the same control system but not as polished as the original the original was fantastic oh. fun but uh, the fact that you know a loss for us mate because we can no longer talk about them in depth as lost to the arcade but a massive win for game preservation and for Sega and just for the community and everyone that's interested in old Sega arcade games a final legal way to play them Aye. and that's the main thing because as much as you know Supermodel 3 you know is great and gives you access, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, to a lot of these games. You know, it's still Supermodel 3, even with its, its user interface kind of add-on that you can do, it's still not the friendliest thing. You know, even I had to put in the, the Scud Race video a link to a, a brilliant um, channel, it Warped, Warped Polygon, he's called, and he's done like an actual modified any file that's on the, the link in the video. And he talks you through how to set it up. But he's basically set all the controls for all the games up for uh, PlayStation and Xbox controllers. So he set that all up for you, which is great. But, you know, you still need to decide if your hardware good enough to handle the advanced 3D engine or can it only handle legacy? It, can your hardware handle it at power PC set in 40? Or do you need to tweak it to 50, 60 to get it to run? It's just, it's not intuitive. This is the way it should be, just... Yeah. You know, so on a modern day console in some form, licenses are not an issue. Get it played. Absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> I've been struggling with Supermodel 3 
um the last few weeks a few, a few days few weeks trying to capture footage for this um a couple of issues with a xbox 360 controller with a lot of stick drift where it seems to only be in model 3 and model 2 games so i don't oh. know if it's part of the config for that and capturing yeah i've had a few issues with capturing so if any of our viewers on the youtube channel do notice any issues with the capture it probably means that i haven't been able to resolve the issues but hopefully uh hopefully it's not too noticeable but um yeah it's not the friendliest thing mate um i've had to uninstall rollback update <coughs> drivers galore to try and get it to work properly on mine uh it doesn't work with amd drivers very well but uh, the latest round of amd drivers seem to work so we're there mate so without further ado i think we'll, we'll go through these and much like volume one we will discuss these one by one um talk about what hardware they launched on who made them um, where, how they should have come home, what console could they have come onto? So uh, I think I'll kick this one off, mate, with a very familiar face that any Sega fan will know. And this is uh, Sega Sonic the Hedgehog. Now, this one was actually developed by AM3. Uh, came out in 1993 uh, for the System 32 hardware. So that's the same hardware that uh, the Sega Saturn was initially based on. Mm -hmm. Um now this one's an isometric action game. Uh, I'm going to hesitate to call it a platformer, purely because there's very little in the way of platforming on this one. Uh, it's up to three players. So you have Sonic the Hedgehog, obviously. You have Ray the Flying Squirrel, and you have Mighty the Armadillo, both of which came back recently in... Um... Christ, why is the game... Why is the name of the Sonic game elevating me? <laughs> the Christian Whitehead one. Oh, um, I am... Sonic Mania. Sonic Mania. I don't know why. I, I own that game on PC, Switch, and Xbox, and I've completed it on every single one of them. Some, so for some reason, my mind went completely back there. Ray and Mighty, present in Sonic Mania, um, originated from this game. In this one, they're basically just almost palette swaps of Sonic. Their faces, the, the muscles the same, the art, the monogogal, um, exactly the same as Sonic. Just one's got a armadillo. Armadillo! Uh, <laughs> Boy, oh, like darn bars. That's a blast for the past, that, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Do you remember your first dying bar? <laughs> Crunchy on the outside, smooth on the inside. <laughs> Armadillo! <laughs> yeah. Except we've both just lost about 20 people. That's yeah. It. Yeah. Sorry, anyone that didn't grow up with the, uh, the UK dime bar advert. Because we're <laughs> fucking old, that's why. <laughs> but yeah, it's. um. So the premise of the game is it's not to kind of make your way through zones and look like um, like the classic Sonic games, or even to go around collecting flickies like Sonic 3D, even though the perspective is the same. You're basically captured by Dr. Robotnik, or Dr. Eggman, at the very beginning of the game, hoovers you up in his big Robotnik face tractor, um, drops you off in his prison island, and you're basically outrunning traps the whole game. It's, it's actually brilliant fun because you're constantly outrunning things, whether it's platforms falling down, lava coming down, falling stalactites and icicles. Fantastic fun. The game only takes about 20 minutes to blast through, but I still haven't beaten it, purely because you play through the eight area areas, and get to the last one, and you've got something like 20 seconds or 45 seconds to gets to the exit and i've never managed to do it but a uh, fantastic game this one did you ever get a chance to play it i've not um i've only ever been able to watch kind of playthroughs of it and you know the, the thing that struck me when i first looked at it was that isometric view i thought well, this looks like sonic 3d blast but <laughs> the pace is just like one of the comments i've seen on a youtube playthrough of it was and this is the most stressful time of sonic's life <laughs> it is because like the thing that, that, that kind of got me is that it's so frantic. Yeah, it is. It's like, it never it never stops. You get to the edge of the screen, something always happens. So as you say, it's like, in the initial part on Volcanic Vault, you're getting chased by the, the big lava ball and the lava's flown, you know, but you're still trying to avoid traps. And then there's, um, oh, what else is it? There's kind of wee monkey bars as well. So you're swinging for them, yeah. but then they collapse and then it goes down like a rope bridge. And you clatter off a wall and you fall back down. Um, just there's just so much going on in each of the stages. Um, what is it? The is it Desert Dodge stage? 
I can't remember the zone names there. <laughs> I've only been playing it recently. But no, I can't uh, even remember Sonic Mania's name, so my, my brain's mush. Sorry, mate. I've, <laughs> I've, I've literally just um, taken notes of them because I was watching this playthrough just to kind of talk about it. But um, I guess the, the desert, you've got Volcanic Vault, Icy Isle, and Desert Dodge. There's other ones as well. But like Desert Dodge was like, what, what's got this? You've got a giant twister. Like he's yeah. big, like, like Bill Paxton, he appeared for somewhere. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, Paxman, Paxton, 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 oh, Paxton, just passed away, Paxton. exactly. Aye, there's a storm coming, it's already <laughs> here. <laughs> this giant tornado is chasing you, but then while you're running through the sand dunes, there's like sinkholes opening up to try yep. and swallow you, and then you think you're almost at the end of the level, and the quicksand appears and you're trying to fight your way through it. You know, while the yeah. tornado's still coming, it's just, there's so much going on in it, and it's, it's a game there's no excuse. I know you said like obviously the control mechanism in the arcade is the the kind of trackball. Track yeah. But just surely it doesn't take much to amend it to an analog stick. It's not the most complex of games, but you would surely think you could bring that to a collection. Yeah, I I think so. Um I mean I did actually play it in the arcades once, very briefly, on one of the trips to I think it might be Margate. If it wasn't Margate, it was Clacton. Um it's one of these things where you, you look it up and you see that it didn't actually get much of a wide release. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because it was very it's a very Japanese centric title. Even the name Sega Sonic is, you know, very localized to Japan. Um, but it did actually get a, a release in all three regions. So it did get a limited release in the US and did get a limited release over in power territories. Um, so it's not a fever dream. I did actually play this. <laughs> I do remember playing it. But yeah, um, the trackball was extremely difficult to play it as. I mean, as a kid, I was, I was, what, this was 93. I would have been nine. If this was, if I played it the year later, it would be 94. And you, because it's Sonic, your immediate thought is to run as fast as possible. And what does that mean? It means just hammering that trackball <laughs> as fast as you can, try and avoid these, uh, these falling bridges and, and everything else. And accuracy isn't the order of the day. It's, it's a lot easier to play now on main with an analog pad albeit yeah. the motion is still not quite right because you're effectively mapping a trackball's movement to an analog controller whereas i think if they if they ported it to a modern system or if back in the day ported it to the sega saturn proper analog movement would have made it a lot easier to control um i mean it's weird the, the trackball you know do you ever play those those PGA games or tee off games that you used to get they, in the two thousands, right? They used to be in like every pub. And That's right. You'd, you'd have you'd have someone, you know, roll the ball back a bit and then. That's right. <laughs> as fast as they can. Get some spin on that, love. There you go. <laughs> yeah, they were they were everywhere. You'd always have someone in one of those. But it's it's the same principle, you know. Whether it's probably the same people that played Sonic like that, playing the golf game like that, about twenty <laughs> years, uh, ten years later. <laughs> The muscle memory kicked in. Yeah. <laughs> Flashbacks of falling off the bridge, <laughs> avoiding that tornado. But yeah, it's, it's a cracking game, mate. Um, really would have loved it to come to... I don't think it would have been possible on the Mega Drive. I think you look at you look at that and Flicky's Island. Flicky's mm. Island obviously goes for the more kind of CG rendered look, whereas the arcade game has definitely has a more anime feel. It does, feel. I. But I... it's, it's so impeccably an animated and so smooth and so much going on with all the set pieces i think the mega drive would have struggled with it uh the 32x was pretty poor at scrolling so i don't think it could would have been at home there but the saturn you know with its with its architecture i think would have handled this in its sleep. it would have been so much fun i know it's short but it could have been a great game on the saturn and that would have been destroyed for its its game length <laughs> yeah it i mean been. put it in sonic jam sonic jam could have been, I mean, they remade the Sonic games to Sonic Jam. It was a golden opportunity there. Yep. You know, you know, put it in Sonic Origins Plus. <laughs> Sonic Gems Collection. The opportunities were there, but uh, it's this one's still lost to the arcade, and sadly, I'm, I don't know if it will ever find its way in. Um, interestingly, though, and it is quite interesting that we find this out now because this week um, there's this kind of Tales YouTube videos. That are the Sega do on the YouTube channel. I'm not sure if it's a Sega one or the Sonic one, but either way. And um, it referenced Knuckles Chaotix 
and Sega Sonic the Hedgehog when talking about characters. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this is new information. This wasn't happened a week ago when we did take one of this episode and someone forgot to hit the record button. <laughs> I've not told anybody that. But uh, yeah, this, this, this happened just a few days ago. So who knows, maybe one day, whether it's its own release, whether it's on a collection, whether it's in Yakuza 9, quite possibly seeing as Sega have acknowledged it and said that it's canon, could still find its way home, mate. We live in hope, mate. We live in hope. <laughs> Deserves to be played. I'd love to actually try it. You know, I think I might have to bite the bullet and get this meme set up and give it a go. Yeah, I've got all the I've got all the information in the uh, in the shared folders for for you. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you can start playing it, mate. But that's enough waffling about Sonic. Let's go over to your very first pick, mate. So, what was your first Lost in the Arcade pick this time around? So, my Lost in the Arcade pick number one is possibly Sega's most morbid arcade game. This is Emergency Call Ambulance. What a no. bizarre game this is. It's uh, <laughs> I was playing it just now. Um, I, th I didn't actually play it in the arcade. Um, I didn't play it until years later. I only played it on a very early supermodel about 10 years ago and it didn't quite work properly. So I got the first chance to play it properly uh, a few months back and I was playing it just now tonight and it's just so dark. Um, it's very yeah. creepy in some ways yes. if you watch the attract mode which may actually be playing on the screen right now just some of the uh, characters in that like the kid with the dalmatian and you know when Aye. it does the cut but like the face off with the two characters they're very they're like they're like puppets almost they're very odd i i mean every scenario it, the game gets darker as it goes on i mean the, the stage is you, your first one which is the car crash which is yeah. the boy in his dalmatian then you get the the street battle which is this, this cracked me up. So it's like an underground car park and there's like a gang looking at men in black and a virtual cop one style looking guys. Yeah. A couple of cops came out. They fired a bazooka at the cops, right? <laughs> but then it shows you the the, 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 the car that explodes, the two cops go flying in this, right? Then you see the cop getting wheeled out of the ambulance and it says the list of injuries, multiple fractures and skin burns. He's just had a bazooka fire <laughs> You know, it's like, come on. But then um, you've then got the fire victims. So it's like burns and smoke inhalation. And then the last one is Air Force One crashes into is it the Michigan River. And you've got to take the president to hospital. Right? It's like, it's just totally morbid. Right? But the actual gameplay itself, it's like, crazy taxi with a patient but you don't pick up multiple patients it's just the one that's in the cutscene but up in the top right hand corner you've got your patient's condition so they're lying there on the, the gun in the back of the ambulance with the, the oxygen mask on and then you've got like their, their wee kind of the, the flat line and yeah. what do you call that that line the boop, heartbeat monitor yeah boop, boop, good, right? but if you take a corner to too rough, if you hit scenery, if you crash into anything, you then get the nurses and the, the ambulance with you, giving you a bollocking, yeah. like telling you, be careful, we're losing him, we're losing him, don't hit another car! <laughs> you hit something and it, it brings up an injury, which gets more severe, so it's like trauma, internal bleeding, cardiac arrest! <laughs> it's like, what? And if you don't get to the hospital in time, then obviously, you know, game over, your patient dies, and then the screen goes red, and it's just, ooh, flatly. It's like, your patient died. It's like, Jesus. It so, doesn't seem to know if it wants to be tongue-in-cheek or not, does it? It's it's extremely macabre. It's it's like, it's almost, it's almost playful, but not quite. It's very, it's a very strange tone to a game. Aye. It, it, it kind of hovers between like in a creepy and B movie <laughs> it doesn't know what it wants to be it's like but I, it's something I think everybody should should have a shot of um, I mean there's one part in the first mission that cracks me up right and you'll know this yourself for playing it there's a part whenever obviously you start with the the, the, the kind of the motorway where the crash happens so the, the, the yellow car and the, the tanker 
you take away in the boy in the ambulance, <coughs> excuse me, and then you kind of go around the freeway and you come down and there's like a kind of wee town area and there's a pond over on the right hand side. God knows who's in this ambulance, but this guy goes <laughs> flying he into does. the pond. It's like, well, I swear he was happy to him. It's just, there's, there's me kind of trauma parts of it. Ah, he's definitely, that person's gone, mate. They're, they're well and truly out of the game. But it's just, they just go phew, past you, right into the pond, flying over like a wee ramp, like a kind of park that's around the edge of the pond. Right off they go. But, uh, no, it's something, as I say, everybody should try it once. I mean, if you've got quite a dark sense of humour, you might sit there and chuckle like hell playing it, but... It is no quite moment. funny. It is quite I... funny. It's just very morbid. It, it's 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 an uncom- it's very it's like a dark comedy, but it's very uncomfortable, like hilarious. It's like um the second mission, I um I did struggle with it. Um but both times I got round the corner for the to the police station and obviously they're like, We're losing him, we're losing him and I'll like, just get round this corner and then it's home straight. Both times went round the corner and this police car just went yes. boom, boom. <laughs> head on <laughs> like you lose like a, when you hit something like the second comes off doesn't it and if you if, depending on how bad the injury off you get minus however many seconds in this one i had like 10 seconds it probably in the footage um and, you go, oh, poof, and it's like boom, 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 boom. Oh. <laughs> I, and it's, you, you imagine though you, you you go to the arcade all happy <laughs> play some sega today you stick a quid in that you're going Back up the road, absolutely manic after playing that. <laughs> it's a tr- it's a lot of fun though. Um, what I, I, I mean, found, yeah, go on. You know, we're, we're, we're painting it as being really it's 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 morbidly fun. Let's not be let's not be kidding ourselves on here. There's, there's, it's dark, but there is fun. There is a lot of fun to be had. Isn't it? Yeah, it's 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 definitely crazy taxi levels of of enjoyment. Not quite as instantly enjoyed because you feel guilty when you fail on it. <laughs> Aye. But it's but it's it's fun. I mean. There's things in it that I, I I love the fact that you can, if you go into a street lamp, you know, you lose points, obviously you lose life. If you crash into another car, you know, you lose time or you lose, the, your patient loses health. But if you decide to drive across the sidewalk or drive over the greenery and try and run over pedestrians, they're absolutely fine. They all jump out of the way. So <laughs> stay, stay off the, they all just go, ah! dive out of the way and there's no penalty there I think it's on the first mission where you've got a, you've got another ambulance that just careens past you and it drives over and you're like oh I'll just follow him Aye, <laughs> he's going through the pedestrians I saw Die Hard with, uh, Die Hard with Avengers isn't it yes. are you aiming for these people <laughs> it's brilliant fun I mean I found it a lot easier in the first person view yes. um, than, than the, the external camera because you get a better idea of how close you are to certain objects. Although yeah. I found that you can still clip things on the side that are outside your field of view. Mm. Um, but uh, it's tough. I mean, <laughs> the the, ty- the time limits on there, um, it's like doing a Sega GT license track test on there. <laughs> how tough those time limits are. <laughs> Less said about Sega GT, the better. You'll find out why in due course. <laughs> indeed, mate. Indeed. But no, um, great game. Indeed. Great game. Uh, Really wish it came to the Dreamcast. Felt like a uh, felt nailed on. Really, it's got the the sort of quirky, sort of arcade. Again, like Crazy Taxi, like Eighteen Wheeler. Um, that you know, obviously Crazy Taxi, huge success on the Dreamcast. Eighteen Wheeler, not so much, but kind of of that same vein, that same quirky, unique yep. arcade experience. This slide straight straight in there, and graphically, graphically, it's not the most intense Model Three game. It, Nope. It really actually looks like an Naomi game. And I think I thought it was once upon a time, back when yep. I first saw it, that it's an Naomi game. Um obviously it's it's a model three game, but I don't think it would have been too much trouble to move it over to the Dreamcast. Put a few more scenarios in there, expand expand the length of it. Um and obviously it's a score attack game, so your performance, you know, if you trying to get that perfect run, no damage run. Could have been a could have been a massive success. Stick in some sort of crazy back box alternative, and it could have been a winner. That's the thing. You could even have had as a double pack with eighteen wheeler because they're both short enough. Yeah, you know, eighteen wheeler doesn't have 
anything kind of major um, in terms of length. I'm not yeah. going to go an 18 wheeler too much. Um, again, you'll find out why in due course. Um, but you know, it's um, it's it could easily have been like a, a kind of quirky double pack. You know, 18 wheeler and, and ECA together. It would have worked quite well, I think. Yeah. Uh, shame again hopefully one day we see this one but uh, for now definitely lost in the arcade i don't think there's a reason that this one couldn't come home no um you know sonic's the trackball but again we think we can never get that a few others would be license issues but this one this one definitely should come home so hopefully one day people get a chance to play it without playing with super Buddle, as great as that emulator is and just able to put it in there ps5 xbox pc switch or switch pro switch to whatever um uh, and enjoy it that way but yeah great call with that one mate and what's next on your list mate next on my list is another quirky game and a game that i did play in the arcade in 1998 in an absolutely enormous cabinet and i fell in love with it straight away and this is the ocean hunter oh <laughs> uh, this one um i i don't know if it's some sort of mandela effect I remember this one having light guns in the huge cabinet that I was in. Um, playing around with the Model 3 emulator though, in Supermodel, it does seem to suggest that it's more of um, like a mounted gun, like uh, LA machine guns or a Gunblade NY, um, because uh, I ended up playing it with the, the joy pad rather than the mouse, because the mouse, for some reason my mouse pointer is all the way over the other side of the, the mm. cursor and it was throwing me off so uh, i started using the pad and it's a lot, lot of fun playing it that way but uh yeah this is this is basically the house of the dead underwater basically <laughs> it's going around shooting shooting sharks the, the story through it is is kind of ludicrous you go across the seven seas hunting the biggest monsters which all seem to be amassing man-eating sharks around them um even down to stuff like you know, you'll get other divers that are getting away from big white sharks. <laughs> and you'll have to shoot them in time and they'll give you extra lives or bonuses. You get treasure and stuff. Um, you get basically three bosses per stage. You get like two sub-bosses and then a main boss. Um, and you're basically an underwater bounty hunter, is how it's pitched. <laughs> and uh, I love the way it says some of the names, like Kraken. <laughs> uh, the, the first shot you, you face white death yeah <laughs> uh i love this one man i absolutely and playing it again uh just rem just remind me how much i loved it i mean in in the cab it was amazing it was one of these ones it was like the deluxe cab where you get down you sit in it and you, you kind of got like a like a veil around you and i think there was you know the perspex between and the screen kind of blown up in front of you so it looks like it's zoomed in and it's just it was amazing the sound behind you um I think graphically it looks fantastic you know i think remember when finding nemo came out and it's like oh you know water is the it's kind of the the grail of like the cg render so it's like pixar made nemo what does sega do or well, they they have you gone to water killing absolutely everything so <laughs> but uh you said that this one reminded you of scars of arcadia i got a kind of a different vibe from it um it kind of reminds me of Remember in the 80s, there used to be a lot of crossover with kind of French, Japanese, French animation and Japanese anime. You'd end up with things like uh, The Lost Cities of Gold. Oh, ah. no. That's right. <laughs> it was a mysterious cities of gold, wasn't it? Yeah, that's it. Aye. The, the characters kind of remind me of that. The whole the whole um, presentation of it really reminds me of kind of that, that sort of animation, like 80s anime or like the French animation that uh, I think uh, Deke were putting out at the time, that sort of that sort of thing. Bogtanian uh, as well, wasn't it? Yeah. Was a... <laughs> I really get that. Showing an age now, by the way. Oh, right. It was, uh, it was, uh, around the world in 80 days, was that another one? That was right. <laughs> and if you know what we're talking about, then you're as ancient as we are. <laughs> yep. And we welcome you to the channel. <laughs> but yeah, I really get that vibe from it, from especially from the intro and sitting in the hot air balloon. You've got these really stylized characters. You've got the very strange map that comes out, um, and then you've got you know all the font and the and the characters and the voiceovers. You know, so sharks are amassing near the creatures. <laughs> As I say, the, the intro did give me like proper skies of Arcadia vibes. Like obviously until they went underwater and then 
that kind of defeats the purpose because it's skies of Arcadia and <laughs> not water. But just the kind of the music and the way the intro, the, the characters looked and stuff, I thought it's a wee bit kind of skies of Arcadia like. But it's funny when you opened this segment, mate, you said it's like the House of the Dead but underwater. <laughs> My note says it's House of the Dead with marine life <laughs> and we didn't talk about this <laughs> we before <did> recording <laughs> no you mentioned the stories of Arcadia stuff over WhatsApp but not, not the house so, I mean, they're, they're both made by obviously I didn't mention this but this is AM1 uh, 1998 Model 3 so AM1 they were behind House of the Dead weren't they mm. so I think the DNA matches up there um, and I, I guess that's why the parallels are there Aye. I mean there's one of the oh what was it again it was in it. Is it the the sea serpent boss that you fight in the underwater, or also on the the sunken ship? Yeah, just looks like a one-headed um, the hydras that you get. Yeah, there's the boss in House of the Dead too. The three the, the three heads of hydras. It just looks like one of them. It's even got that same animation where it, it kind of throws its head back and the mouth lights up because you know yeah. it's getting ready, and that's to tell you where to shoot it. It's the exact same. Yeah, exactly the same. You actually you actually do fight a hydra in there. It Do comes, you? But, yeah, <laughs> and again, it's the same thing. And you have the little receptacle that comes over it, over the mouth that you have to shoot. Um, so it's all, <laughs> it's all very similar, all for much of the DNA. It's one of those ones. If you, if you love House of the Dead, you love out light gun games. You will love this. Now, obviously, these days light gun games are a little bit more difficult to, mm. you know, bring home. Uh, not to say it, they can't come home. Uh, the fact that this is done with you know mounted guns so it's not pure uh you know light gun focused you know you don't have that you know response from the crt back to the guns you can actually use the cursor and it actually works it actually plays quite well with a pad mm. i think this could be great to come home i mean back in the day you'd have loved this on the dreamcast i think it would have been great on the dreamcast and using the um using the old dreamcast light gun would have been great but uh yeah i'd love to have this one at home again maybe in the future yak as a game but we need that model free collection mate we do you know and stuff like this doesn't have any license issues no you know it's like i was laughing at as well as playing 18 wheeler it's got signs up for like the holiday inn and stuff <laughs> it's like holiday inn next exit it's like <laughs> stuff like ocean hunter doesn't need life there's no licenses in it just it doesn't it's not like when we were talking about Harley Davidson in the last one, or you know, with obviously Lost World. Honest, Lost World. It's not like a Top Skater that's got the whole Pennywise soundtrack. <laughs> it's nothing. There's nothing stopping Ocean Hunter from coming home. You know, bring out um, uh, a pack. You know, put it on a disc with the original House of the Dead, uh, the sequels. Uh, you know, two, three, and maybe four, and the Ocean Hunter, and that, that would be fantastic. I mean, I'd love to have, I mean, it's one I've never ever seen in the arcade, so I'm quite envious that you got to play it in the, the deluxe cab, because I think that, from the way you describe it, would have been a hell of an experience as well. It was, I think it was very, they're very similar to the old Lost World cabs. Yes, you know, the, can imagine the kind that. Of boxy ones, um, but I remember it vividly. Um, I can't remember if I saw it in multiple locations, I think I did, but I most remember it in um, Drummond Park in Hemel Hempstead, it was there. Um, I think it, I might have seen one in Birmingham few years later um in star city but yeah whenever i saw it mate i loved it um fantastic fantastic shooter um well worthy of coming home um, hopefully one day it does but uh talking about games with uh with licensing mate uh would you like to tell us your next uh next entry well i'm saving the big hitter for last yeah. so um, i'm going to move on now to this is not a uk hoover brand <laughs> Although whenever you hear it, you might think it is. This is Dirt Devils, which I think can only be best described as Sega Rally meets Motorstorm. That's a brilliant description. And uh, playing it, uh, this is one that I haven't ever given an awful lot of time to. Um, for some reason, always got mixed up with um, Speed Devils. Yes. In name yeah. on the Dreamcast, which did come to Dreamcast and is completely unrelated. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it very much is Motorstorm eight, nine years before Motorstorm was a thing. Um, fantastic game, mate. First thing that jumped out at me was look at all those sponsors. <laughs> 
Yes, and I think that is probably what led to CVG. Was it issue 206 or 207 that we found out that they said Dreamcast version rumoured? Yeah. Now, no wonder, because all the advertising boards along the side are all Dreamcast with the orange swirl. Yeah. So, every chance again, this is one that, that Sega looked at and were maybe going to pour, and it just goes back to that, that line. And a lot of these games... Like you know, like your Ocean Hunter as well. Like it just comes back to that Sega line about not wanting to stigmatise the Dreamcast with arcade ports. Yeah. But we just lost lost out so many great ports because of it. This one, Dirt Devils, it's not. It's this kind of there's a a view you can do on it, and you can same as Daytona, you've got like the kind of closer behind and your yeah. further back one, but. The further back one made the wee cars look like micro machines. I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, you get that view so. as well if you crash. If you crash really badly, the camera will come, will pan out. Aye, <laughs> aye. But uh, the announcer sounds like the guy from Manx TT. He does. I think it must be the same guy. <laughs> Has to be. Has to be him. Don't Please sell. select the bike. Aye. aye. <laughs> Please select the course. Please select the bike. <laughs> Please choose manual or automatic transmission. <laughs> then the fun. best one, if you do the time attack, go! <laughs> Blow you. That's the best at the checkpoint in this one. Aye. I can't Aye. remember That's what he says. Of... But... I can't read either, actually, but no, it's just the accent and the, the sound is just it's exactly yeah. the same. It like, has to be him. has to be. Yeah. I, I remember that, um, that issue of CVG vividly. This is like, yeah. Dreamcast version rumored, and it it looks great. I mean, it is by um, again, it's by AM1, but it really does look like um, you know the way that the, the models get all dirty when they go through all the mud and everything. It does give you Sega Rally Two vibes. Yes, in terms of the in terms of makeup, although obviously the cars are all over the place. You've got you've got a Hummer, <laughs> and you've got the little Beetle, and you've got these you know proper um, like uh, desert. Desert buggies and stuff. It's ah. it's it's absolutely bonkers, but it's oh, it's absolutely brilliant fun. Um, I'm used to say it, um, but yeah. uh, <laughs> it's absolutely terrible. Though so my first attempt, I managed to finish third in the first two courses. The last one, the last course is really something though, uh, because obviously it's the most complex course to race around, the most jumps and stuff. But you start off kind of in daylight dusk and as you go around the time of day passes mm. which is a really nice um and that's the, that's the course that's obviously got the dreamcast the dreamcast adverts on there um alongside i think there's like adverts for all sorts of things like pepsi and all sorts on there there's loads of billboards um, aye so just how much how much brand awareness can you put into <laughs> one game you know and it's just like in that that's something that wouldn't be hard to replace no, I don't think the billboards would be. I think the cars would be. You know, at the very beginning, uh, it's like we would like to thank hum Humvee for lending us their likeness. Yeah. <laughs> but um, no, something. it's you can't miss. Just say, just they could do something with it because I think, like we say, an Ace and Classic. So I'm sure the cars and that have got little kind of brandings on them, similar to what you know the Scud race cars have got, like Golf and Esso and all those kind of things. Just. Scrub the textures out, mate. That's it. Just... <laughs> yeah, it's tremendous fun, though. Like the, uh, as, as I say, I'm bad at it, but the way that you can kind of break and throw the back end out and like, it's careen round corners and drift round, it's it's Sega Rally on steroids almost. And as, as you say, it's you know, like Motorstorm. Motorstorm must have taken inspiration from this because the, the way that the cars bounce around ah. is so similar. It's such an extreme looking game. Um, I don't think it would could, could have been that difficult to port to Dreamcast because it's a fantastic looking game. Don't get me wrong, but it doesn't seem like it doesn't seem to have like think, the visual complexity of stuff like Sega Rally Two. No, it's it's definitely simpler than Sega Rally Two. I know what you mean about the, the effects. Now you're like, skidding around that kind of like trail that the cars leave. Yeah. That's very similar to the kind of Sega Rally Two kind of. I remember that effect kind of blew you away whenever you seen oh look at it spraying up the the dirt oh well it looks amazing but it, it is very much like Sega Rally 2 handling wise you, you flip that back end out and it's like loose and you can you know fire it round like Sega Rally 2 you can take corners it's 
stupid speeds and daft angles, even in the Dreamcast version. Yeah. Like, you try that on the Saturn version of Sega Rally 1, you're getting nowhere. <laughs> it's just totally different. But, aye, it wouldn't have been difficult. I had to think, you know, don't do it on Windows CE. <laughs> do it on the, the Dreamcast Zone SDK. Yeah. It would have been fine. It's, um, yeah, I think the loose handling in suits it a lot more than Sega Rally 2. Yeah. Um, it just feels natural. And it, it just feels like a, a load of fun, pure arcade fun, barreling round corners over, over, you know, you go over jumps in Sega Rally, you go over huge, huge jumps in the, in this one. It's like, yeah, you'd expect to get like a Forza Horizon, like jump bonus in there or something. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, oh, it's a superb game, mate. Um, one I hadn't, as I say, one I hadn't played a lot of, but uh, glad that this was on your list because it got me a chance to get really well acquainted with it. Good stuff. So what have we got last on your list then? Last on my list is an interesting one. Uh, another one that I actually played in Jarman Park. This is uh, by AM1 in 1996, and we're, we're going to the Model 2 this time. This is Wave Runner, a water ski racing game. Um, Released the same year as uh, the N64's Wave Race. Um, I always wished that this one would come to Saturn. Obviously, the uh, the arcade cab was kind of those big stand-up ones. You had to hold right. onto the bars on the side, put two feet into the into the into the paddle, which was meant to be where you put your water ski, and you steer like that. Um, superb fun in the arcades. Um, really loud, bright, huge bright colours, blue skies. But I think that I think the Saturn could have done this one because um, the water effects, and this is where it's kind of. I can see why they might not have wanted to bring it over. Um, but the, the waves in it aren't as pronounced. Wave Race sixty four got an awful lot of praise for kind of its wave effects. Aye, whereas in Wave Runner, the water's kind of flat. Um, it's, the, the waves aren't as pronounced. For me, I think Sega Saturn, you know put a VDP2 layer of water over that and job done. And then you put the rest of your polygons and textures on the riders and the scenery. Um, I think it's a stunning looking game and an awful lot of fun. And again, another one, going back and playing it now, I think it I think it could have been brilliant at home. Aye. It was all the rage, wasn't it? It seemed to be like, there was a, a point in the mid-90s where like <laughs> water, water ski, jet skiing games were like kind of in. <laughs> And I remember what you were saying about the, the kind of praise that Wave Race 64 got. I remember that. Oh, it's the best water effects you've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and to be fair, they were impressive, you know, at the time. But, aye, you, you look at what the Saturn was doing. She said, mate, get VDP2 handling that water. What a problem. Yeah, I mean, you know, VDP2 could have rendered it um, translucent, you know, because it would have been 2D sprite. Um, and, yeah, I think it could have. It could have looked great. I mean, you see, you see it in stuff like uh, Panzer Dragoon, you know, the, the, mm. the translucent water effects, and having the having the jet ski go over that could have been great. Obviously, you've got the jumps and everything, and you've got the, the scenery around. I don't think if you if you if you're dealing with the flat water surface, I don't think the visual complexity is that much more than Max TT Superbike. No, no, I would agree with that. Um, and you know the fact that the water is textured. Wave Race sixty four was impressive. It was the 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 water is kind of just just blue. Whereas I love the I love the kind of nineties texturing of it in in, in Wave Runner. Um, it's 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 enormous fun. I think the first the first track's pretty easy to get around without the tip hitting the time limit. Uh, the second one's a lot more challenging. Obviously, you know if it was to come home, it would need a lot a bit more content. Same criticism that people have to throw at Banks TT. Yeah, but um, it's it's very similar in that in, in that respect. But uh, yeah, I, I'm a big fan of this one, mate. One on the get on the old emulation again. I hadn't actually even heard of it until you had mentioned it to me for this episode. <laughs> I was like, if you said Wave Runner, I automatically went, "Hold on, that not like similar to the N64 game." I was like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But uh, no, I mean, look again, looking at kind of playthrough videos of it, doesn't look like anything that the, the Saturn couldn't have done. Um, possibly, did, is that maybe why Sega maybe opted against it with the, the direct comparisons to, you know, there's been nothing mentioned in any of the, the leaked documents. It was never a title that was, you know, there's a list of titles that were meant to be coming, or that 
uh, so we just assumed that Japan were going to do for them. Yeah. <laughs> um, that wasn't mentioned in any way, but maybe did they think, oh, well, Wave Race 64 is doing these really special water effects with our console look inferior because it's not doing yeah. as pretty? You just don't know. But again, it's one that aye, it would have it would have certainly stood proudly alongside the likes of like steep slope sliders, stuff yeah. like that, you know. Again, your kind of extreme sports titles. You know, steep steep slope sliders is great fun as well, obviously snowboarding, but I no reason why we couldn't have had this one as well. Yeah, I mean you look at stuff like um Sonic's World and Sonic Jam, the water effects in that. Yes. Um yeah. that has the almost exact kind of look that you see in the Model Two Wave Runner game. Um, which makes me think you could have done it. You know, if you do you if you if you're if your water is just a flat single plane and you build your scenery around that, I'd love to I'd love to have thought. But yeah, like you say, I don't think this was ever on anyone's radar to bring home, no. sadly. Um, Manx TT always was. You'd look at those Sega documents and even way back in early 96, they're talking about it. Obviously, it didn't come home until 97. Uh, but this was, they never had a peep about this one, which is a shame because, as you say, it's getting into those late to mid nine mid to late nineties when stream sports are becoming all the rage, your wave race games, your cool borders games are probably kicking off. Um, Tony Hawk is not too far around the corner. <laughs> what new a metal time. About, new metal's about to take off. What what a time. I say when my split talk to my sitting in the office today my Spotify playlist came on and rolling by Limp Biscuit came on. I was like, oh my god <laughs> That nerd government and that. <laughs> That's my red cap. Oh, so, tell you a funny story. It's, again, we'll just we'll go back to this in a minute. Right? So, in early 2000, 2000, 2001, whenever Chocolate Starfish came out, right, I was a massive Limp Biscuit fan, massive new metal fan, but I was also like that, right? Not this rotund gentleman that you see in front of you today, right? But I was at uni, and I, I went to Glasgow Caledonian Uni. So, if people from Glasgow are watching and know this, like, there's a Royal Concert Hall at the top of Buchanan Street, Sucky Hall Street, where they meet, and there's like steps, and that's where all the nerds and all these kind of delinquents hang out. I've went to uni with my three-quarter length combat trousers, my baggy white t-shirt and my red New Era cap, purchased from Foot Locker. Yep, they sold them, the actual proper ones that Fred Dust had, the New Era, New York Yankees, red with the white NY backwards I'm running down the road <laughs> so I ran past the steps of the concert hall with this Ned we group of us sitting there shouting keep on rolling you <laughs> dick <laughs> yeah, absolutely shamed never went out in public dressed like that again mate so there we go yeah <laughs> Ridic ridiculous tangent nothing at all to do with but Sega arcade games extreme sports new metal it's all, that, it's all about that era I mean we're just talking about you know licenses and you know we're talking about extreme sports Top Skater Pennywise you know all that sort of stuff I mean well, look at the soundtrack for Tony Hawk's 2 probably one of the, yeah. the best soundtracks going yeah just full of new metal when worlds <laughs> collide what a track <laughs> oh what a time mate I mean it's hard to believe that was 20 years ago I know when we opened up to the 90s felt like yesterday I mean the, the early 2000s really feel like, <laughs> it's, it's, like it's like that wrestling meme that somebody sent me it's like what you think wrestling was 20 years ago and what wrestling was 20 years ago and it's got like Hulk Hogan and Macho Man but it's actually Stone Cold and The Rock and you're like oh my god <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's not far oh. off it. it's, it's not far off I think they called it a day Mostly in 2003, 2002. It was WrestleMania 20. I mean, we're going way off piste here. Bye. WrestleMania 20 was gold, but was WrestleMania 20 was when Brock Lesnar first quit WWF in his rest in his in that match with Goldberg. Well, WrestleMania 18 was Hogan and The Rock, wasn't it? Was that yeah, 18? That was 18. Jeez. Probably so, about 40 odd. Yeah. So 20 years ago, it's probably more like the early John Cena years now. You can't see me. <laughs> oh dear. Anyway. anyway. <laughs> Back on topic, Back on please. Yes, yeah, so that's Rave Runner. Um, extreme sports, new metal, 
end of the end of the 90s early 2000s what a time to be alive but uh talking about icons mate um you know we started with an icon with sonic the hedgehog we're ending with another icon with your final pick which is an absolute doozy oh this this one mate it's only fair that we're going to talk about a star wars game and as obi-wan would say this is a star wars game from before the dark times (laughs) before ea it is star wars arcade trilogy or star wars trilogy arcade or the prequels uh, before the prequels, <laughs> before the nonsense. <laughs> it's uh, it's interesting to think that Star Wars at this point was only just really coming into the public consciousness again because of the the special editions had just been released in the um, in the cinemas again. Right. Uh, was it ninety seven? So they'd just been shown. Obviously, Sega snapping up the rights to 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 bring us another. Star Wars arcade game, um, but this one's oh, this one's so good, mate, isn't it? Oh, it's the settings as well. So you've also got the Battle of Yavin, which is the the first movie that the Death Star, where you yeah. you fly down in the trench eventually, and you need to fire the torpedoes, and they go down, and the Star blows up. You've got the Battle of Hoth, yeah. so you're taking on the the Walkers and the the eighty eighties or Atats. I never know how you print it. Is it Atats or eighty eighties? I don't know what you call them. We go between the two. No, nah, Star Wars fans. All terrain, all, all terrain attack vehicle. Attack, uh, tra- attack transport. The best toy ever, by the way. See, if you had the, the big 8080 toy. Oh my God, that was amazing. The side panel came down, you could put all your figures uh, on it. I never had one. I had the ATST, oh. the Ultra. Yes. So, and that one, you had the, the button at the, the back. back. <laughs> and the legs were. <laughs> <laughs> I've just broke Dan. <laughs> oh, oh. They were brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so, we grey button in the back to make it walk. Yeah. The clip always broke in the leg, I had to clip it back in to make yes, it walk it again. Did. Yeah, oh, I always used to lose the t- panel at the top as well. Yes, that was long gone, mate. That was well away. But I so the Battle of Hoth, you take on them. <laughs> You've got Endor Ground Mission, which is the speeder bikes, and then you get the kind of as well, the Hoth and the Endor ground levels, after the initial kind of, you know, vehicle-based part of the game, you then go back on foot and, you know, and, and Hoth, this is a funny thing about the, the, the Hoth one, and you go on foot into the base, like you take on the snow troopers, so they've got the kind of the stormtroopers with the longer kind of white yeah. kind of clothing. The, what do you call them? The, the Wampas are there. <laughs> why, why are they there? Like you try to get to the Millennium Falcon, there's like five or six wampas just walk up to you, like, yeah. uh, try to get you. Like, <laughs> it's like, what was happening here? So you need to shoot them to get to the Falcon, and again, on Endor, you've got that bit where you need to get to the wee hut, the communications hut, mm. where like, obviously, you know, um, where Han and Leia try to get in, and they've got R2 try to hack into the, the yeah. wee panel. You've got to see off the, the walkers as well until they get in and stuff like that. Um, there's two bonus stages as well. So you've got the the battle with Boba Fett, yep. which you're looking here kind of on the the wee barge at like, uh, Jabba's kind of palace, um, and then the, the other one is at the end is is also Luke versus Darth Vader from Return of the Jedi. Yeah. But there's an extra mission which comes after, which is Endor Space. So you're you're up taking on the fully armed and operational <laughs> battle station. Um. And you know yourself how that plays it. That thing's still operational. <laughs> well, come on, Han, oh buddy, don't let me down. This fight, this range, we won't last long against those Star Destroyers. <laughs> it's, a, it's a trap. <laughs> That's longer than we would against that Death Star. We might take a few of them with us. I'm afraid it will be fully operational by the time your friends arrive. <laughs> We're going to do the rest of the podcast now in Star Wars quotes. That's it. <laughs> Get chewy. <laughs> if that's came through the mic, we'll be doing well. If not, yeah. we'll edit it in. <laughs> um, but I, it's it's great. It's it's so faithful to the scenes of the movie. Um, it, again, the iconography is perfect. The the Endor level when you're on the speeders is absolutely amazing. You know, the the Hoth battle was great in terms of. 
you know, yourself flying in between the legs of the walkers and taking them out. But the speed of the sense of speed and the speed of levels go through that forest on Endor is absolutely so brilliant. Outrageous. Ah, <laughs> it's superb. Um, this and The Lost World are probably, for me, the two biggest regrets. You know, obviously Scud Race and Daytona 2 were massive losses, but see, I think in terms of major franchises, to give Dreamcast that kind of... Because you've got to remember, like, Jurassic Park's big now, but you think that Jurassic Park, as you say, Star Wars back then, the special editions that just came out, you know what I mean? Prequels so, around the corner. Exactly. So it was just ripe to, to tie Dreamcast into those two massive franchises, and it was just a, another missed opportunity. Whether the license ran out, or whether Sega just didn't think there was any legs in it again, was it that whole don't want to stigmatise the console with, with, with arcade ports, but you've brought out a light gun peripheral, and apart from House of the Dead 2 and the rather shallow confidential mission, there's not much else that I can think of. Virtua Cop no. 2 got a port, um, but I still think it's better on Saturn. So you're putting a peripheral out there that's there's nothing really no. for it. So missed opportunity, massive regret for those two because those franchises could have really tied it all in. You know, go to see a new film, trailer for the Dreamcast game, tie fans in, two massive franchises. Yeah. Money. This Jurassic Park was still, I know obviously after the Lost World, Jurassic Park ran out of steam for a little bit, but we yeah. still got the third sequel a couple of years later. It was still yep. a huge deal. Kids still love dinosaurs. <laughs> and, Mate, you know, was, kids, kids still love dinosaurs. My, my, my daughter loves dinosaurs. Yeah. My son you know, it's just, yeah. No, I mean, it's just the fascination with them never goes away, I think. It's just... Yeah. And um, Star Wars especially, you know, we're a year out from the prequels. The prequels would have been... 99, we had The Phantom Menace. Yeah. So and <clears throat> that may have been an issue if there was cut some kind of contractual thing where, where George Lucas said, oh, we don't want to release anything in the uh, sequel trilogy. we just all got to be about the prequels now. Or anything like that. It might have been something in, along those lines. But the thing is, when I first saw in Sega Saturn magazine the images of Star Wars Trilogy Arcade, as I had a picture of the film. Now, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, you know, I don't, I don't think Star Wars graphics have got much better than they were in this game. I mean, it it really does look the part. Mate, obviously, the character renders are a lot more low polygon, but the battle of Yavin and the ships and the X Wings and the TIE Fighters just all looks absolutely spot on um, and Hoff as well and the indoor space mission whenever you take on the, the super star destroyer yeah and you fly along the surface of it and <laughs> mate it's it's not just like basic little blocks like you know yourself and have you seen the film the flying along the surface of the, yeah. the death star and that and it's like and the the star destroyer all the different little kind of nooks and crannies and lights and cannons and it's just it's so detailed just unbelievable it's as you say, the character models for like um, little Luke's hand with a lightsaber and Boba Fett and, and Vader, they're not compared to like new games or nothing special, but it's the, the environments like Endor, Hoth, they're all absolutely amazing. Yeah, it's the art design that absolutely makes this game. It's absolutely spot on. Um, obviously, this is this is a game that released in 1998. You know, and you look at, look at what was around in 1990. Obviously, we had the Dreamcast at the very end of the year. But then you had, you know, what's the biggest game in 1998? Well, Metal Gear Solid, you know, as amazing as that game is, visually, diff different league. Zelda Ocarina of Time on the N64. Again, Star Wars literally light years ahead of it. Uh, even the stuff that came to the Dreamcast, you know, couldn't touch this. Um, no. I think with the Dream, I think there's the Dreamcast, you know, if it wasn't on Windows CE, you know, on the, on the, uh, a proper skew of the Dreamcast where if, you know, a lot of focus I think this could have been a very good port on the Dreamcast and it could have been it, I think it really could have got some momentum behind it, especially for Star Wars fan who, who could, there was no game that looked like this and if you look at the Star Wars Episode 1 adaptations that came after they were all pretty pretty pants um, I like, as much as I've got a real soft spot for Jedi power battles um, it, it, looks, it looks like bobbins compared to this <laughs> But do you not remember that Dreamcast adverts were shown? The Barber advert was shown 
at screenings of the Phantom Menace. It was, yeah. So if you've ported or you're going to port <laughs> Star Wars Arcade Trilogy, don't show some idiot cutting somebody's fucking hair. Show them that. <laughs> show people, them stuff. People are running out of that movie theatre and they're going to pre-order a Dreamcast. Yeah, they are. <laughs> they are. Up to six billion players. Not really. <laughs> no. No, that get taken down pretty quick, didn't it? It was just... Box advertising, although not now. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I... It would have been great on Dreamcast. The only thing I think would be difficult to emulate is the fact that it was all done via the kind of a flight stick, wasn't it? Which not only, well, you know, you could mimic that with either a light gun or a, or the control pad. But where I think where it really came into its own was the Darth Vader bonus level, um, yes, because it felt like you actually were wrestling with a with a lightsaber. Aye, those would have been difficult. But I mean, the the Dreamcast light gun had a D pad on the back of it, it anyway, just yeah. the VMU port, so you could still have had for the the vehicle and the, the on the on the ground stuff would have been easy even better idea with dreamcast fishing rod for the dice oh there you go mate that would have been that would have been perfect <laughs> chef kiss what do you do with that fishing rod and fighting Darth Vader <laughs> oh it's fine people were so getting so calibre with it that's right aye, aye. <laughs> wasted Look. opportunities mate I know, but mate, that's that's our that's a half a dozen. So you know, six games so far, no ports. Two games that have got ports that we started off with. So it's not nice to touch on them, even though they were in the original list. Um, great that they're now coming home. But yeah, I think some of these, mate, I think they're destined to stay lost. Uh, Star Wars trilogy in particular, uh, I can't see that ever coming home. No. Um, and Dirt Devils, given the vehicle licenses be a struggle although i'd love to see them rebrand it bring it home um the others though emergency call ambulance wave runner uh sega sonic and um uh, and uh the ocean hunter i don't think that they'd uh they shouldn't have too much trouble bringing those home uh which is a real shame so come on sega you know what to do just every yakuza game just give us more arcade stuff i'll give them all of them aye <laughs> and then whenever you're finished Put them all on one collection and just release the Yakuza arcade collection. <laughs> there you go. There we go. Well, mate, it's, uh, it's always, as always, it's been a blast talking through these. And I don't know, we could do a Lost in the Arcade free. I think there's plenty to plenty to mine on these. I was thinking of stuff like, um, you know, the Moonwalker arcade game, the free player one, the <laughs> isometric one. Um, there's the Sega Water Ski, which is a bit of an oddball one on the Sega Model 2. Not one that I ever saw, but plenty of those. So, yeah, definitely something that we can keep tapping into as long as Sega don't bring these home. If they do bring them home, even better. We'll talk about them when they come home. <laughs> exactly. And I think whenever we get our hands on also the Spike Out and, you know, Daytona or Sega Racing Classic 2 <laughs> to give it its new 2023 name, then we will we will cover them on the channel as well to kind of to see how they they fare when yeah. they've come home. But I can't personally Daytona two can't wait to to try it on a, a modern console and a, like you know yourself if you play Daytona the three sixty version either on a three sixty or an Xbox One or a, a series console on a big telly that widescreen mode razor sharp visuals it's like oh. How good is this? <laughs> the thought of playing Daytona 2 on a gigantic TV without any issues setting it up or anything. I'm just literally <laughs> going to play that, get my save game standing at the cabinet <laughs> and just leave it there. <laughs> Sitting there like, skip cut scene, skip cut scene, skip cut, skip cut scene. <laughs> Don't care about the story, mate. Don't care. Just get me to the arcade so, so I can play Daytona 2. Yeah, so we will be bringing, we will be, we will, we will see that on the channel, I think. Uh, day one on Game Pass. Uh, so um, that's brilliant. But mate, it's been a blast. Uh, viewers, listeners, hope you've enjoyed listening to us talk about classic arcade games that came home, that are coming home, that haven't come home, living in the 90s and early 2000s, Limp Biscuit. <laughs> Red caps. Red caps. But I uh, would love to hear from you. Um, what games 
that are lost to the arcade would you like to see come home? Are there any that we've left off that you'd like us to talk about? Would you like to see a lost in the arcade three, a lost in the arcade four? Uh, drop us a line, whether you're in the Sega Radio Sega Discord, whether it's in the comments below, whether it's on Twitter or X as it's known these days. <laughs> you can find us on there at Sega Guys. You can find myself at Super underscore D. You can find James at the Sega Holic. But until next time, stay Sega, and we will see you on the Sega side. Yes, we will. Sega. <laughs>